Hey Year 12, this is Lesson 4 in our study of the UK Executive. Right, we're going to start with a memory retrieval, four minute exercise. This is in preparation for our assessment week that's coming up on Parliament. So the question is, explain and analyse three recent reforms of the House of Commons. What can you remember that would help you plan for this particular question in four minutes? To do that, and if you're not sure what four minutes sounds like, M people will provide you that method. Put on that link, give yourself four minutes, pause the video now, have a go. Okay, to check your work on the memory retrieval, go back into your OneNote, make sure you've got what you need there. Okay, it's part of the process you should be using each week from now on up until our assessment week. Okay, our work at the minute is uh, looking at the cabinet and how relevant it is in modern government. This is the question we want to be able to answer in the end. We're going to analyze and evaluate this statement. So far, we've looked at the IMF crisis in 1976. We've also looked at the Westland affair in 1986. And today we move on to look at the Iraq war in 2003. Our third prime minister in this time is Tony Blair. We want to be in a situation where we can consider the, fa the factors that were relevant to the cabinet's use in terms of the Iraq war. So we're going to be considering its majority size, the political context, the experience of the ministers and the impact. Remember the IMF crisis, no ministerial resignations. The Westland affair, two ministerial resignations. Now we're looking at Iraq. OK, so let's look at the political context. Blair came into power in 997 with a huge majority of 179. You can see here how that pattern falls over time, but he still enjoyed a significant majority in 2001. And it's only in 2005 that really this majority declined to under 100. So when we're looking in 2003, we're still talking about a prime minister who enjoyed a significant parliamentary majority at this time, and therefore significant power. This particular link, if you can get onto it, which will take you through his Blair's satisfaction ratings, is brilliant because you can click on various events which impacted upon Blair through his time in office. If we look at the actual Iraq war, we have to be careful not to just look at hindsight, but to consider the time and therefore how the prime minister was perceived at that particular point by his party and by the country. Looking at articles from the period, you can see that he had the support significantly of his party. He had a large rebellion he had to deal with, but such was his majority. He could cope with that and still consider to move on. Understanding that the Iraq war is probably what we consider a bipartisan issue, with the Conservatives more than likely to support Blair, sometimes well ahead of his own party itself. So in that context, it's important to consider how the cabinet was going to act. Were they going to support Blair or were they just going to challenge him and perhaps because of such a significant issue, resign? It's also important to consider the media. Look how interesting this is. The Daily Mirror, classic supporter of the Labour Party, against Blair in this situation and against the idea of the war, where the Sun, who had supported Blair since 1997, were very much in favour of what he was doing, reflecting the fact that he was very much a centre-right uh, politician for the Labour Party. Um, compared to some politicians of the past. So that's the media interest. This article, which I, which I provided you with in OneNote by Michael Bryan, was written in 2002. And the interest about this article is the fact that it's predicting the situation in regards to the cabinet. Concerns that people had about the way Blair dealt with this cabinet throughout this period. They saw him very much as a prime ministerial Prime Minister, really dominant Prime Minister. Therefore, what he did was he actually controlled his cabinet and there was very limited ways in which the cabinet could challenge his decision making. But on the issue of war, Brown was concerned that perhaps this style of government would not be appropriate. And what he was raising the issue is how collectively the decision making would occur in the future. This was in 2003. In doing your research into the Iraq war, I want you to consider three key other articles. One by Robin Cook, who quit over the Iraq crisis and the reasons behind that in his resignation speech. Another from 2011, so looking back eight years, which is called Tony Blair went to war without cabinet consent. And finally, one from the time, which is 
Claire Short's resignation, which wasn't at the time of the Iraq war, but afterwards. And I want you to look at those three as they all comment on the nature of Blair's cabinet methods at that point and how, and how individual ministers made their decisions. The articles are PDFs that I've sent to you, so look through those, please, with the aim of then going on OneNote and putting your notes in there in preparation for our seminar. So next week, what we'll do is we'll talk not only about the Westland affair, but the Iraq affair. And what we can do there is we can compare the two and we can see how the prime ministers use those particular events, how they use their cabinet, how they try to control their cabinet and how decisions were made. If you want to find out a little bit more about Blair, read Riddle's article on Blair, prime minister or president. It gives you a broader context. It gives his opinions on how uh, Blair manipulated the domestic policy at the time and also the nature of his collective cabinet government. So that's available to you as well. Okay, good luck.